Before we go into the podcast, I want to just talk about a business that I've set up with my friend George. Uh, it is called the Podcast Introduction Group. So if you want to join and be able to be featured on 24 to 48 pods, podcasts to be able to reach an amazing audience, this is the place you need to go to. Podcast being a guest on podcasts is automatically establishing you as an authority and is able to build your personal and professional brand. We hand pick of a bank of podcasters that we have to be able to grow your business and brand. We do a hundred percent of everything that needs to be done by my team. You do not need to lift a finger. You are able to expose yourself to new and relevant markets by going on other people's podcasts. You also are able to create brand loyalty. People will love listening to you and coming back to your products or services and it's able to increase your revenue. So if you want to be able to get involved, you can sign up quickly, registered with a with an account manager. There's an onboarding call where we target the podcasts that you want to be on, the type that you want, whether it's entrepreneurship, business, health, fitness, whatever it is. We then match you to those podcasts and you can start your journey. We have regular catch-ups with our account managers and Google ranks you when people search for you. So when people are searching for you, you're able to see your podcast at the top of the list. So if you are interested in being a podcast guest on multiple podcasts, we are the place to go. If you go to podcastintroduction.com and go and register your details, we will have an, a, a quick call with you. Uh, match your your podcast that you want to be on and we can then start this process asap thank you so much for your time i appreciate it back onto the podcast then just one last thing before we go into the podcast i just wanted to talk to you about the fact that i have a youtube channel that has been going for quite some time and i am recording and releasing all of my interviews with some short videos as well on youtube so please do check it out youtube on absolute business mindset you'll see a bunch of interviews there all the longer format interviews and some short videos as well so please enjoy that and here goes with the podcast interview this is the absolute business mindset podcast created and hosted by mark hayward this podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into the area of expertise. Get ready to learn from others' successes and failures. Today, we have Alexis Hasselberger, um, who's a time management and productivity coach. Hello, Alexis. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. It's going to be a really interesting conversation with corporate stuff with startups and then your coaching business so I'm really looking forward to this conversation as always we start with your education and this is a surprising uh degree (laughs) I I I must admit I had to google it so you did a degree in existentialism which is the philosophy of the inquiry that explores the the problem of human existence and centers on thinking, feeling, and acting. So tell me why you chose that degree. What what, what was the inspiration for that? Yeah, so I so I actually, it's actually even longer than that. I did existentialism, early education theory, and studio art. <laughs> so oh, all together. Okay, a real mix. Um, right. So basically the the real thing is that I read a lot of like Sartre when I was in high school, and I really loved the kind of idea. I found that existentialism as a philosophy was the most hopeful philosophy that I had right. ever found. Because most people actually think it's very depressing. <laughs> and I just found it incredibly hopeful because to me, existentialism was the philosophy that we make our own meaning and that we get to decide right? What our meaning is in life. And so um, how I ended up studying that and having a degree in that is that I went to New York University and I went to the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, where you basically got to make up your own major. (laughs) And as long as you could defend it at the end, we had at the end of our four years, we had what we called a colloquium, where you had to basically 
basically make a, a defense of your education to a group of okay. professors and your advisor and all of these people. And if you passed, then you got your degree. And so I basically just took classes I was interested in, and then I tried to make it all work in the end. <laughs> so what would have happened if they had rejected? Would you have no degree, even though you spent three years studying? I don't think that anyone, I mean, I honestly don't think that they would let someone get so far into it. You know, you have an academic advisor the whole way along. And so I really, I think I don't, I had a lot of, you know, a lot of friends in that school and nobody, you know, people did all sorts of things. My best friend did pre-dentistry and sculpture. That was her major, right? (laughs) Like, like we had a lot of things and, and I think that, um, yeah, I don't think that they would have let us, uh, go down a path where, you know, they, but why didn't you just choose philosophy? And study across the board on philosophy? Uh, because I, you know, I, I don't love all philosophy. And I really, I think I was, when I was in college, I was not focused on what kind of a job can I get with this degree? I was very much focused on what kind of classes can I take that will be really fascinating and interesting to me. And yeah. so existentialism, uh, the kind of the study of existence and making our own meaning had a lot of really interesting facets to it. So I took, you know, I did take some other, like I took classes on Buddhism and I took, you know, I I remember one of my favorite classes was called American Road Trip. (laughs) And it was basically just like reading all of these like novels and, um, and accounts of road trips from like, you know, the beginning of the United States to now. And, I, I just, I took, I took a class called a sense of place. I remember like, it was just about, you know, just really interesting courses and I, they all seemed to fit into existentialism to me. <laughs> what, what, what university did you go to? I went to New York university, NYU. NYU. Okay. And is that quite used to like NYU has, has this, this sort of make your own degree up? Stop. There are, um, so there are several schools within the school. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's a school of general education, there's a school of education, there's a school of business, there's a school of medicine, there's a school of dentistry. And then there's our little school, (laughs) the school of individualized study. (laughs) Okay. And so, um, so I actually was in the, I was in the general, you know, the kind of general school. I don't even remember what it's called at the beginning, my first year. And then I started like looking at all these interesting classes and I was like, oh, these classes are in this, this other school over here, this kind of like little one on the side and so I switched into that school because I just thought it was so fascinating and um I'm assuming that it from what you said that so your degree and the the areas you studied was not necessarily for a particular job that you were working towards did you have any idea at that age what you what you wanted to do no, I had no idea. I mean, I, I had always been a person who worked. So even in high school, you know, I had, I was like a legal assistance assistant, you know, I had kind of like these administrative jobs and, and I worked pretty much full-time through college as um, the office manager of a boutique M&A firm. And so I had like, I, I had kind of administrative experience and I was not thinking at all about career. I was literally just thinking, what can I do right now that is going to be really fun and interesting for me and is going to get me a degree at the end? And I still actually feel, you know, having been in HR and been in all these things for a long time, I I feel like a liberal, if you have a liberal arts degree, it does not matter what the degree is in. Right, right. Because really what you're saying is like, I am a person who is capable of analytical thinking and getting a degree. Whereas like engineering, things like that, like those are very specific tracks, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. You're just, you're just proving that you can learn how to learn something. Yeah. You can learn how to learn. You can, you know, you can get stuff done. You can, you can pick be things able. up and stuff. Yeah. Like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I've never heard of that before. So that's completely uh, uh, taken me back. I think that's a fantastic idea. I think a lot of people, uh, uh more and more people are being fashioned into some sort of vocation and get their experience to help them with an accountancy degree or business degree. Um, but I think that's great. I think that's for someone who wants to learn and, and, and find some interesting subjects to, to, to go on. Okay. So you moved from, from your degree into HR quite quickly. You, you were an M and a firm and you were in other firms within HR how did you get to, as you said, you didn't have any sort of plan in your degree. How did you get into HR? 
Yeah. So, so basically I got in through office administration essentially. Okay. So in, you know, in college, I had had this job for where I was, I was basically running, you know, I was running a team of researchers who were doing m and And I was also, you know, doing payroll by hand, calculating all of this stuff. Right. And I was keeping the office supplies there. And, you know, I was, I was kind of managing the office of this place. And so I acquired a lot of administrative skills and I've always been a person who's quite organized and, um, and just kind of, I don't know, good at getting stuff done, you know? (laughs) And so when I, when I left college, I got a job um, as an office manager of some, I have a window company and that was very boring to me. And so then I decided that I would move to San Francisco. (laughs) And so I moved from New York to San Francisco. I also had no plan. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Don't, that, that, I can't just be <laughs> passed over. To move from New York, which is a particular like high intensity and sort of like um, hustle bustle, the grind yeah. of, of New York to San Francisco is yeah. a massive change. What, well, what drove you to fly the other side of the U.S.? So I grew up on the West Coast. I grew up um, outside of Seattle, so on the West Coast of the U.S. And um, and what I felt like in New York was that I I, I felt like I was going to be poor forever. I just felt like I was not competitive enough to make it in that war. Like I, I mean, I could have I could have done it, but I just felt like it was not going to be the kind of life that I wanted. It was going to be too much of a grind. Like there were always going to be people who you know had trust funds who would be willing to do my job for less you know less money and no benefit. Benefits, and mm-hmm. it just felt like it was going to be a real slog. Okay. And so I felt like I wasn't like, I loved New York. It was a fantastic place to go to college and be young. I didn't feel like it was a great place for me to kind of grow up oh, or you know, grow up as an adult. And so I actually, I moved, I decided I was going to leave and no idea what I was going to do. I drove cross country with my best friend all the way from New York, 3000 miles across the country to, um, to Seattle where my parents were. And I stayed with them for a couple of months trying to figure out like, what is my next step? And in the end of it, I just decided to put my resume on Craigslist in San Francisco. I just put it up on San Fran- wow. the Craigslist of San Francisco. I had never been to California before. Okay. <laughs> so I just like put it up there. And two days later, this attorney in San Francisco called me and she said, I saw your resume on Craigslist. My assistant just quit and I have an extra room in my house. Do you want to move to San Francisco and be my assistant and live in my house while I find an assistant and you find a job? And I said, sure. Wow. Right. Okay. And so I called her references because I wanted to make sure she wasn't crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I drove a U-Haul down to San Francisco two days later and I never left. And that was, you know, 18 years ago. <laughs> right. That's fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. So that first role was HR. Yeah. So the first job was an office manager, as office, yeah, manager. office manager, but we all, your then, progression was into then HR. And yeah. was that, was that of, um, of necessity or was that a strategic choice? You thought that this might be something that you might be able to grow into in, in different roles. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of interesting as an office. So I worked in startups basically. And as an office manager in a startup, you're basically doing all the things that aren't sales or engineering, right? Yeah. So you're, you're doing the HR, even if you don't have HR in your title. Wow. And at, at one point in this startup that I worked for, um, there was kind of a shakeup and like a reorg and some of the top leadership was leaving. And our internal, um, our internal uh, council said to me, um, you should get HR in your title. Like when we, uh, when we leave, make sure that you get HR in your title. And I was like, why? And he goes, I just think it's going to be better for you. You're already doing the work. Just get HR in your title. And so those people left and I was, I was still there. And I said, well, I would like a, um, you know, I'm doing all this work. I'm going to be taking on this more work and I would like a director's level title and a director's level salary. And they gave it to me because they were Amazing. Like, and so then I, I became, I think, operations and HR manager or something like that. And then that allowed me to pivot into the next job I had was like a senior HR manager job. And right. I kind of took the work that I'd already been doing and pivoted it into that more HR track. And when I looked through your career on your move in between different roles within HR, <clears throat> there was there was a change. It wasn't you were moving every six months or mm-hmm. whatever. There was a an issue with you. It didn't look that way when you were looking. Yeah. You were there for a year, 18 months, two years, two and a half years, and then you'd move on. Were all those roles 
were they sort of strategically chosen or was it again was it a necessity maybe the company changed or pivoted or closed or whatever they, as I said there were there were sort of you know like you were progressing through in different businesses yeah so so my first job I think I worked there for three years or so and then I moved on to I I, I became I don't know I just I just wanted to move on I needed a change and yep. so I found another job in HR that job I w- I was actually laid off while I was on maternity leave. Oh. Um, so super fun. Yeah. And, and I was the HR person at that company. <laughs> so <laughs> so did, you, like, did you get, did you say to yourself that you had to leave? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, it was kind of ridiculous. I feel like I did some of my own HR paperwork, you know, <laughs> and, um, but I negotiated myself a pretty good uh, severance package out of there because good. I was like, okay, well, you know, you have laid me off while I'm on maternity leave. This is yeah. kind of ridiculous. Um, and so then after that, I got a job uh, where I actually was there for about seven or eight years after that. Right. And so that was that was more of an HR consulting type of a job. So I worked at a company that did payroll benefits, HR for other companies. Right. And so I worked kind of in client service there. Oh, okay. And okay. Then, so you changed to consultancy sort of side. Or, yeah, it was like kind of in-house consultancy, I guess, is what right. I would say. So I basically was like a de facto HR manager for a lot of different companies all at once who would call right. in with their questions, et cetera. Um, and then with that job, uh, that one, we got bought by, like, we got acquired by a large insurance company at one point. And I really liked small companies and the startup environment. And so moving from a company with 30 people to a company with 10,000 people was not not yeah. something I liked. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so I left that job. Um, and then I went to work for the San Francisco Deltas. Yeah, that's why I want to have a conversation with you about that. So you were chief of staff. Now, yeah. What is what is chief of staff? What what is the role? It's a funny role, right? So I for the first the first year I was there, I was actually the director of stadium operations. And so we were um, using a stadium that was part of the San Francisco Rex and Park Department. And part of you know our agreement was that we did a lot of uh, upgrades to that stadium. So I managed um, I managed basically a lot of construction work and and getting new lights and new seats and and all of this. And you know I built a uh, a locker room at our practice stadium out of shipping containers with um, with the help of a company and kind of a lot of like very logistical things. Yeah, and yeah. then after the stadium was kind of up and running and I had hired a team to be managing, you know, game day and the games, then I switched into this chief of staff role, which was really, it was like a lot of departments had a dotted line reporting structure to me. And so I was kind of overseeing a lot of things I was doing um, legal and finance and, you know, like interfacing with all of those people. It's kind of like, I don't know, maybe office manager on steroids is what I would call it. Right. It's Love like, it. yeah, yeah. it's again, it's like, I did all the things that weren't managing the stadium and weren't playing the games and weren't coaching and all of the other stuff, you know, I did. <laughs> we'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X-Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X-Men, that's X-Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain-computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X-Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. Um, and um, and so that I saw that you oversaw the development of the new stadium, which is which is a major major role. Um, and uh, uh, it just it just it's just interesting how that role evolved into, as you said, you literally did everything that wasn't coaching, playing, yeah. um, and stuff like that. So um, on, on building that stadium, was it, was it a new stadium or was it existing? No, no, we were, yeah, it wasn't, it was an existing stadium that we were upgrading for okay. our uses. Right. Yes. Yeah, so. And how many people did it end up holding? I think it was like, if I remember correctly, like maybe it could hold 8,000 people. Okay. Um, it was actually the the stadium that we used was, I mean, I'm, probably your audience is not familiar with American football, but it was the original stadium of the San Francisco 49ers football right. team. 
yeah. um, back in the day. And so we just made a, we made some major upgrades to the stadium. And then we did the same for our practice stadium, which was actually a different stadium. Okay. Fantastic. So, so just to clarify for those in America that aren't aware, so you, you call it soccer, don't you? We call it soccer. Yes. I know that that's sacrilege <laughs> everywhere else. <laughs> In, in a way, it kind of is because, it, but I understand because you've got American football, which which I actually quite enjoy. But um, um, and and so it, 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 to to classify it, but yeah, mo- the rest of the world calls it football, but yes. you guys yes. call it soccer. Anyway, so so the Deltas actually won the NASL Championships in 2017, which must have been a huge achievement. Um, we did. It. Unfortunately, yeah. what I read, I must admit, it was on Wikipedia, but it said on 12 days after you won the championship, it unf- unfortunately folded. Um, I don't have to go into a massive amount of detail, but from the highs of winning the championship to it folded, it must have been a huge disappointment for you. Yeah, I mean, we, I, you know, it's one of those things where I knew before, you know, like I knew that this was coming. Um, And so it was, you know, it was sad, but we ended on a high note. That's how we all felt. We were like, we did this amazing thing. We were there for a year. We, um, we won the championship with this team and the stadium that we had put together from scratch. Right. I mean, not the stadium, but the team. And, and we felt like we had accomplished something pretty amazing. And then we had to shut it down. And I think that, you know, that sound that can sound kind of depressing and you know it was sad but also when you work in silicon valley in the startup world i mean i don't think there's a single company i've ever worked for that still exists in the same format that yeah. it did when i worked there right either either things fold or they get acquired or they pivot and so it to me just felt like we were a startup soccer team and yeah. you know we went the way of some startups <laughs> and um what happened to the stadium? I'm sorry to obsess about the stadium, but what happened to the stadium after you left? What was that? Oh, so the stadium is still, so we were really just like leasing the stadium from okay. the city. Right. Okay. And so, you know, it's funny. My, uh, one of my kids had his flag football, flag American football, uh, um, championship he was in the championship this year and they played at that stadium their championship game (laughs) so you know it's used there's a running track around it it's used by the city it's used by the parks department um and so it's used it's used for a lot of kind of events and things like that okay thank you thank you for sharing that so let's move on to when you set up alexis hasselberger coaching and consulting so why leaving those sort of HR operations jobs? Why did you decide to set up a coaching and consulting business? Well, so, I mean, the real reason is that when I, when the Deltas folded, when I left that, uh, that role, I had worked for the same CEO at two different companies for the last 10 years. And I had built just a lot of autonomy in those roles. Like I felt like, yes, I did have a boss, but like, I didn't really feel like I had a boss. You know, I I really just felt like I'd had a lot of autonomy. And when that ended and there wasn't like another, another place to go with that CEO, I just felt like the idea of trying to go prove myself some, like I hadn't interviewed anywhere in 10 years. I felt like the idea of like trying to go get a job and prove myself to someone else and just like go through that whole process again to gain that same level of autonomy was so distasteful to me that I was like, you know what, I'll just start a company of my own and I'll figure it out. And so that is the, that's the reason that I decided to go out on my own. And then in terms of the coaching and consulting, you know, over my, over my HR career and over those roles, I had had a lot of, you know, I, I was always a really productive person. Like I, you know, while I was doing the deltas, I only worked 30 hours a week and I got all that stuff done. Like I was working, you know, I was, I I was, I was always really good at like ROI on my own time and people were often coming to me for those skills. And I had kind of integrate, you know, lots of different companies that I'd worked for. I had kind of built our task systems from the systems we were using or built, you know, customer service engines of, you know, so that we can, so that we can repeat our work and not have to, you know, be more efficient essentially. Mm -hmm. And people had started coming to me for that kind of, that kind of um, thing. And I, at the Delta's, 
very early on, our CEO had said to me, hey, do you think you could do a productivity workshop for the team? Because I think everyone could just really benefit from just knowing all the things you do to make yourself more productive. Mm -hmm. And because he had always said like, you know, Alexis can do in 20 hours what anyone else can do in 60 hours, right? Right. And so like, I just kind of had had that reputation. And so when I went out on my own, I said, you know what, this is a skill set that comes pretty easily to me. And it's a skill set that I have seen not come easily to a lot of other people, right? A lot of people are very successful and do it through brute force. And I was always very much about how do I do excellent work with the least amount of time and effort possible? And so I saw kind of a gap there and I thought, you know, maybe I could teach this stuff to other people. Because what they do say is that, especially in sort of the startup arena, the lazy person is the best person to to have because they find the most efficient way of being able to do things. Is that that your experience as well? Oh my God. Yes. I call myself a very driven, lazy person. (laughs) (laughs) Like my goal is always have as much time for myself and my family as possible. Like I really like reading, lounging, watching TV, walking, you know, taking walk. Like I really like, I, I get it. You know, I like work, but it's the last thing that I like. You know, there's many other things I would like to do before work, right? So I really enjoy what I do, but it's still like the last, it's the last thing I want to do. There's so many other things I want to do in life, right? And so, yeah, I, I feel like I've always been someone who just like, I want to be excellent, of course. Like mm-hmm. that's really important to me mm-hmm. doing and doing something meaningful, but I want to do it in a way where I'm not, I'm not like hitting my head against a brick wall over and over again. So, so the word I've just written down here is focus. It seems that what you're doing now is sort of laser focus, teaching people how to be laser focused for, mm-hmm. I don't know, five, six hours a day, and then stopping and, as you say, walking, watching TV, spending time with family, whatever it is. Uh, is, is that a fair assessment? Is the word focus an important one for you in your business? So I think focus is definitely a part of it, but what I always say is like, we are all different, right? So what I want might be very different from what you want. And so what I do is I help people to learn to use their time in support of their goals and values, whatever those happen to be. So, you know, sometimes I have a, I have clients who say like, I really love working and I don't mind working 80 hours a week. I just feel kind of out of control because I don't have systems to keep track of everything. So like I do get it done, but it feels really stressful the whole time. Right. Or I often work with people who have achieved like a pretty high level of success in their career, but they've done so maybe at the expense of family, health, personal life. And so I try to help get people into alignment with what, you know, how are they spending their time? What are their goals and how do we make those match? And who who do you find your clients that you work with? I I, I did see, I did see, and I'm not sure if I've written this down, but you've worked with some big on your, um, on your corporate side that you help in those, I, 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 I saw that you mentioned a few major big companies that you've worked yeah. with as well. Um, how does it work produce, like being a productivity coach for mm-hmm. larger corporates versus the solopreneur or the small business owner that's, that's building and growing and scaling? How does, mm-hmm. how does the, the role that you do differ for the startup versus the corporate? Yeah. So I think it kind of comes into how I deliver my services. And so for instance, I have, I do a lot of one-on-one coaching with people and they can work at, you know, any company at startup versus a large company. I'm using kind of the same process because mm-hmm. most people are actually, you know, everyone has their own things that they're dealing with, but um, we're using kind of an individual process to work within their environment, whatever that is. Yeah. With corporate work, I am, when I'm not contracting with an individual, what I'm usually doing is workshops. And so I will come in and do, you know, three hours or, or now, you know, and nobody has an attention span for three hours anymore. So most often I'm doing like 90 minute sessions on something really laser focused. So like task management or focus and distractions, or, you know, really popular these days is making meetings better, right? Like how do we make meetings better or managing up? And so really taking these laser focused skills that I might, you know, when I'm one-on-one coaching, people are getting the whole shebang. And when I'm doing workshops for companies, they might pick a particular skill that a lot of people um, are needing, and we might dive deep on those sorts of things. 
So from a, this is this is my my selfish question, which as a podcast host, you're you're allowed to. I don't I don't know how we work it, but I'm I'm allowed to ask you something very personal. So so working with my team, I because I, I worked in tech for a while in the corporate, we used to do agile methodology, and one of the things that I found really useful there was the stand up meeting, yeah. the thirty minute or 15, 30 minute meeting that you have in the in the morning just to prioritize make people accountable work 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 out what you're going to do my personal question is is that the most efficient way to work with a small team to have that sort of 30 minute stand up every morning in your view yeah so i mean again it depends on like the culture of the team but i but i think small is the key there because yeah. i agree with you for a small team i think that the stand up is a really great thing especially if you can keep it to like 15 minutes because yeah. it's just kind of like everyone going around saying here's what i'm working on here's where i'm blocked we learn from each other i mean at the deltas we did a daily stand up right um yeah. you know we were kind of a startup in the football world, right? Um, I almost said soccer. Uh, But I I do think that that's a really effective method. I think it tends to break down the larger the team gets, right? Because then it just kind of takes too long. But I do find a stand up to be really effective. It, um, you know, some companies, especially when you're moving like a startup, tech startup is moving really quickly, that can make a lot of sense. Now, if you're a company where maybe you're not in tech or maybe like, you know, a a small firm of lawyers, maybe this doesn't make as much sense, right? But if you're all interacting and working on a product together, I think the stand-up is really effective. Yeah, I do as well. I think it's working really well. Um, How do you ensure that you banish overwhelm? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is people, a lot of times, or most of the time people feel overwhelmed uh, because they do not have any system to keep track of all of the things and they're trying to keep it in their head. Mm -hmm. And when you try to keep things in your head, one, it just doesn't work, right? Because, you know, maybe it works when you're a kid and you have maybe three things to keep track of, but when you're an adult and you have a job and a family and like other people's work to manage and your own, it's just, it doesn't work. And it feels really overwhelming because we feel like there's never like, there's this anxiety in the back of our head that we know we're missing something. We don't know what it is. We don't know when it's going to come back to bite us, but we know that it is right. And so I think the first thing that I do with people is I say, let's figure out a system to keep track of all the things that you have to do, that you want to do your open questions, like all of that stuff, get it out of your head, get it out of all the places where it exists, sometimes people come and they have, they say, I have systems, but they have too many systems, right? And that's overwhelming too, because you can't linearly prioritize. And so that's really the first step to, to reducing that overwhelm is to try to keep track of everything in a place that is not your brain. And in one place. Something I've uh, started in 2022, which has really helped me and maybe my listeners might be able to sort of empathize with the the approach I'm doing and I'd be interested in your view is not at the end of my working day but at the end of my day Mm -hmm. I write I basically brain dump thoughts that I've had things that I need to do people I need to speak to I just like, and it's literally, and it can be work. It work usually is work related, but equally, if I've got to make personal calls or to the school or whatever, whatever, I I put that all in my list, and that's what I take to the next morning. So my stand up, I've then thought of right personally, I've got to contact these three people, some someone who's working with me. You need to do that and do that, and and I found that like mind-blowing how successful instead of storing everything in your head and literally trying to cram everything in um that actually that brain dump at the end of my day has been really helpful like what's your thoughts on that yeah 100 percent. and i bet you're getting better sleep now too yeah I, yes <laughs> and that's actually the driving force behind right. why i started doing it because yeah. i was struggling to sleep because everything was rattling around in my brain so i just thought yeah. at the end of the day just dump it out and then get ready for the next day yeah yeah so what i have people do is i so there's there's brain dumping which i think is incredibly effective 
at the end of the day, I think it's also really effective to do at transition points. So at the end of your workday as well, because sometimes if we're still thinking about that stuff, it's hard to be present with our family at dinner. Yeah, we might absolutely. be still thinking about what's yeah. going on. Um, but then, you know, our brain doesn't stop. So we want to do another one later. And then also, um, you know, anytime we're, anytime we're feeling overwhelmed, like if we're just like, oh, you know, sometimes we get stuck in that analysis paralysis of like, there's so many things to do. I don't even know where to start. Yeah. If you just take a second and like, write down what's going through your head, it becomes a lot easier to say, oh, okay, I do this first, I do this second, this one doesn't have to happen until next week or whatever. Um, and then I also think that doing this, what I teach people to do is not only to do this um, all, you know, at, at specific points in the day, but to basically be adding to your system whenever you think of something. So I have a personal rule. If I've thought of it twice, it goes in my system. Okay. Because I know if I've thought of it twice, I'm going to think of it again. And it's not going to be at the time that I need to get it done. <laughs> so um, so putting it in the system, I have a client who calls this brain littering instead of brain dumping. <laughs> okay. Um, and one of my guests uh, previously, uh, Chris Marhafka, talked about the superpower which we have is, I'm going to use the word meditation, and it's not a meditation. It's It's slowing your brain down and taking a few deep breaths when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling too much pressure, stress, whatever. And he talked about this superpower that everyone has the ability to do is just to slow yourself down. And actually um, what it does is it makes you feel uh, as a human more comfortable and, and, and sort of grounded. And then you can then approach whatever you're looking to do. Do you use any sort of meditation or breathing exercises part of your uh, your coaching or or, or 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 consulting or are you more uh, focused on uh, like what you're trying to achieve so i am more focused on tactics but that doesn't mean i don't include things like that what i find for i, I think like that's true when we do take a deep breath and we slow ourselves down that helps what i find with a lot of my clients is that it's remembering to do that. <laughs> That's yeah, the problem, yeah. right? Like if they, if they can do that, then fantastic, but it's the like remembering to do it in the moment. Yeah. And so I work a lot on habits and habit building and like, how do we, how do we do that? These types of things. And what I often say to people is that when we're trying to build habits, it is very helpful to like, when you're trying to build a habit, right? You're trying to erode one neural pathway while you build another one. Right. And so it's kind of like a hiking path, right? You have to, you know, if you keep going on the same path, that one's going to get deeper. And if you want to start a new one, you have to keep trampling it down in the other direction a lot of times. And so where I use body related things is when you notice that you're about to do something that you don't want to do, like say you don't want to be checking your email every five minutes, right? Um, then spending just getting into your body for even 10 seconds by taking a couple of deep breaths or trying to listen to the farthest sound you can hear or rubbing your fingers together just so that you're kind of just anything to get out of your head gives you just yeah. that little bit of space to be able to, instead of reacting to thoughtfully respond to what right. you're doing. And, um, and something else I've just thought of while you were speaking that you said about constantly looking at emails and that sort of stuff. How do you um, help or maybe an example of someone that you've helped that's been overwhelmed by notifications of emails, social media, CRM mm. systems, whatever it is, you, you get inundated on these mobile phones with a hundred notifications a day. How do you help people that feel overwhelmed when the, the attack of technology is taking too much of your own time? Yeah. So I tell everybody to turn all the notifications off. Really? Um, all, 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 all of time. them. The only notifications that I think are valuable are for our meeting notifications, like right. two minutes before your meeting so that you're not right. late to it. Yeah. Um, but email, Slack, social media, all of that stuff, it is so damaging to our kind of psyches and our productivity. And it doesn't actually like getting those notifications doesn't actually help you be more responsive. It just takes away from what you're doing. And so there was this study done a few years ago that showed us that every time we get distracted, so every time a ping or a ding, or even just that little flash of light comes up, it yep. takes us on average 23 minutes to refocus on what we were doing. Oh, absolutely. Right. So that you're, okay. you're really tapping into the, I read a book by Cal Newport, the deep, uh, deep work, deep yeah. work uh, yeah. which is just, 
which he does. And actually, I think he wrote his second book, which I've not read or listened to, which is about email and completely getting rid of email. But so, so are you, are you thinking to make yourself more productive, turn off the notifications, maybe look at it two or three times a day and then collect your answers and respond to them, but do it on your, your own agenda rather than the company that you're the, the, the tool. Yeah. hundred percent. And so it's going to be a little bit different for everybody in every role, right? You know, if your um, job is email, like if you're a customer service person, you don't mm-hmm. need notifications because that's what you're doing all day. Anyways, yeah. if you're yeah. someone in kind of a corporate environment, uh, I think that most people can get away with processing email three, two, three times a day. Yeah. Um, and you will probably be more responsive than you would if you were kind of checking constantly, this constant yeah. checking. Yeah. Now, of course, there are some, you know, some people are a little afraid to turn off the notifications, right? You do have to build in that batch processing of, mm-hmm. um, of your communications. And you can have, like, maybe you want to have a notification on for things that come from your boss, right? <laughs> or maybe you want to have, like, do not disturb on your phone, but you allow exceptions for your spouse or your child's school or yeah. whatever. Yeah. But I think the key is that we really want to, like, all of the technology that we have is amazing. And it is all built to pull our focus, right? And so what we need to do is say, does this work for me? Usually the answer is no. And then I, what I tell typically tell people is turn them all off, except for the meeting notifications, and then only turn things back on if you find that you're missing that, right? If there's something happening. Because otherwise, you're right. It's like, I mean, what do you do with all those notifications other than get distracted? Yeah. <laughs> You know what? I really might I might trial that just for a week or two or something, and just to see the impact. Because if I'm if I'm expecting a WhatsApp message or I'm expecting an email, emails are slightly different for me. But if I'm expecting a WhatsApp or I post something on Facebook that I want people from a business perspective to look at, I'll be triggered to go and look for that. Mm-hmm. We're intentionally after I finish something right. I'm gonna try it I'm gonna try it yeah. for a week I'm gonna try it Alexis I'm gonna try it for a week uh starting on Monday I'll switch everything off apart from the the meeting notifications and then designate times in the day to look at email or WhatsApp yeah. or Slack or whatever the the the, the tool I'm going to try it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you feedback, Alexis, on on yeah. on how that how that works. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, well, I've made a discovery today. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so, looking to the next two to five years, what's your sort of plan for your business model and for yourself? Yeah. So my plan for my business, so as my business has grown, um, I I found myself in a a very lucky position where I have a pretty long wait list for people who want to work with me individually. And I am not able to serve all of them and also keep my own time boundaries because there's, you know, I'm, I'm regularly telling people, great, I'd love to help you in six months, right? Which doesn't feel good. And so I am moving more of my business to a a group-based model with, um, like I've had some success with online courses. I have about 66,000 people have gone through my online courses in the last couple of years. And so I am moving to a model that's more of a hybrid where I'm able to serve a lot of people at once um, via a kind of combination of a really robust online component Mm -hmm. with curriculum, as well as group coaching and live Q&A calls. And so I'm moving to more of that. I will still do the corporate workshops. um, And that's kind of that's leveraged for group size as well. But I think this will allow me to really scale in a way that one on one work doesn't um, allow one to scale. And Forgive me if I'm asking, because I'm interested from a coach's point of view. Um, I've worked for coaches. I've been a coach for a while as well. Do you think that your your groups, online groups, will get the same value as one-to-one? Like, Do you think that you'll still have one-to-one clients even when you're transitioning to the online business? Like, Do you think you can – will you do a VIP service – yeah. One to ones. I will. I think that I will still have um I will still have kind of a, you know a, a limited number of one-on-one clients over this time. Um but I what I found is I have been running group coaching programs wow. and people get really good results from them. And yeah. so what I've found is that what I can, you know, when I'm working with people one-on-one, it's much more of like you know, it's much more conversation and me tweaking their, spe- you know, working together to tweak their specific things. Mm. And when, and the online component is still there, but it's not as 
prevalent. Whereas when we shift to group, what we're doing is we're making all of the, all of the stuff that I would tell someone in a coaching call, we are turning that into curriculum so that people can really do it in a bite-sized way as well. So they can say, make progress in, you know, as little as 30 minutes a week of taking little chunks and then also have that support as well. So I, yeah, I mean, I think there'll always be space for both, but I would love to be able to serve more of the people who want to work with me. And how do you feel? Because I, I'm thinking about for my podcast course, I train people to be a podcaster and I'm thinking about having an online component. But one thing that worries me and concerns me is that people who buy just online courses, I think it's something like 25% of people who buy online courses finish right. these courses rather than starting and then giving up or stopping. How are you going to... Um, how are you going to manage that? And how are you going to try and ensure that people do complete your training, online training? So I think that's why having that live component is really important. So I do have online courses that are just online courses through Udemy. Right. And, um, you know, I, I think, well, I'm sure a lot of people don't complete it, but a lot of people do. And it's working yeah. really well for them and more yeah. people are taking it. But with this kind of um, hybrid model, there, I actually am still there, right? Like I'm still interacting with all of these people. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm providing them with a lot with, you know, with a lot of, you know, support via them reaching out, but also I'm providing kind of updates in terms of here's where you should be right now. Have you done this yet? Like, what are we, you know, where are we as well as having kind of weekly live Q and A's and coaching so that people feel, you know, they they're in it with other people too. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's that kind of group aspect of it also. So, I mean, I'm going to hope for the best and keep tweaking. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know what, I, I think the, uh, I think there is a space for that online course and do a three hour course in bite-sized chunks. I think there is a place for that. Um, I, I think it's really powerful. I, I was talking to another guest of mine who, who uh, was, was uh, working and she said, that the power of online courses is that hybrid model where you might have a zoom call with 20 people, 50 people, a hundred people, whatever it is, but just to have that mix of, right, you've got to do this module this week and then we'll then catch up next week and there might be questions or availability. So I think that hybrid way Mm -hmm. of working is really good to be able to ensure because you're you're providing this course, you want people to complete it. You don't no one who, no one in the world who who starts an online course wants only 25% to complete it, do they? So right. I think it's really smart using that, that um, ability to use the hybrid of both online and sort of workshops as well, even if there are online. Yeah. And I also think it's the best way for me to continue to make products that really serve the people that I work with, because if I'm not actually talking to people and hearing what their questions are and helping them troubleshoot, then, then what I do might become stale, right? Mm -hmm. I need to act like, it's really important for me to continue to engage with people. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the the key word that actually you used a little bit earlier was creating a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that is different to starting an online course. Mm-hmm. I really think there's, there's there's something in there that means that you're invested in your uh, your clients in your customers a lot more than I don't want to call out that there, there are some very high profile gurus or mm-hmm. uh, or uh, what would you call them for, like influencers that yeah. throw up these courses for a few hundred dollars they get thousands of people sign up for them and no one completes them no one does anything with it and I think that that for me is a little bit irresponsible because there is that such a low level of completion so Mm -hmm. using that word curriculum I think was very important for me understanding what you do what you do because you're building a student base that they can then take it on and be able to do great things in their careers and businesses right right and the curriculum that I've built is the direct it's directly from the curriculum I use with my one-on-one coaching clients. Perfect. All right. We're coming to the end of the interview. I asked the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. Some people are called them thought provoking as well, which uh, are you interested in what you think? First question is what's the best decision that you made? I think the best decision I made was moving to San Francisco because I met my husband six months later and I, you know, I got a couple of kids and I really love living here. Fantastic. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? 
never work more than 40 hours a week because then they will expect it. (laughs) That is so true. When I worked in corporate, I worked in corporate for about 14, 15 years. And um, you're absolutely right. If you work till 10 o'clock at night, then people then expect you to work yeah. till 10 o'clock every night it's a really yeah. the weird um it's a weird weird environment corporates are really bad for that are really bad for that it's 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 not the best environment for uh people's health and well-being in my view but that's totally. just my view um who helped you most in your career I would say actually it was the CEO that I worked with at um, the Deltas and at that prior HR consulting company, because right. I I think without that experience and having had so much autonomy, I don't think that I would have feel, felt comfortable starting something on my own. Amazing. Do you have any regrets? <laughs> I always say that my, my only regret is seeing the Indigo Girls instead of Sir Mix-a-Lot at Bumbershoot in 1997. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> It's like, it's like a music festival in Seattle. And I right. always regret that I went to see some like folk band instead of Sir Mix-a-Lot. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Right. Okay. I understand now. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's a good regret. I get some, I, I either get two answers, you know, this question is one that really divides people. You have the camp who are that. I am a sum of all of my experiences and therefore I have no regrets, which I respect as an answer. I think it's a bit of a cop out if I'm honest, but I I do respect that, that you are where you are with whatever, however many years experience, or you get the, the, the sort of reflective people that are actually a little bit more honest with me and sort of say, I should have done this earlier. I should have done it slightly differently. That is the first question. That's the first time I've asked that, that um, that I've had someone quote a music festival that they didn't go to and, and didn't <laughs> see the Beatles or didn't see Rolling Stones or something like that. So uh, thank you. That, that, that's a unique one. Thank you very much. Um, what are you most proud of? Um, I think, you know, for me, I think it's really around like accountability and integrity in myself. And so I think I am a person who, pretty much without fail, always does what I say I'm going to do by when I say I'm going to do it. Right. And I think that that is what I'm most proud of. Yeah, that's awesome. And what does legacy mean to you? Not much, honestly. Like I, I'm not really concerned, you know, as an existentialist, <laughs> I'm concerned with the here and the now. And I'm concerned with um, with what I do here in this life. And I'm not very concerned about legacy. Fantastic. Okay. And where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Yeah, best ways to find me are my website, alexishasselberger.com, which I hope you'll put in the show notes because no one will be able to spell it. Um, (laughs) Or people can find me on Instagram at do.more.stress.less or on Facebook at do more stress less. Lovely. Thank you so much, Alexis. I really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was a blast. Cheers.